Uh, Stephen Key is an award-winning product developer. Uh, he's a renowned intellectual property expert and he is a lifelong entrepreneur. His products have uh, been licensed to lots of companies around the world um, and been retailed in places like Disney and Walmart and 7-Eleven. And he's been endorsed by some pretty amazing people, including Michael Jordan and Taylor Swift. And uh, in 2001, he founded a company called uh, InventRight, where they help inventors be able to get their products to market through licensing strategies. Uh, he wrote a book called One Simple Idea, which I encourage you to read. It's a best-selling book that's been translated into six different languages. And he's also a frequent writer in places like Inc., uh, entrepreneur, and the design website Core77. So please join me in welcoming Stephen Key. Well, how's the game? Any score yet? Right? No? Come on. You can, you can tell me. What's going on? Anything? The basketball game. Come on. We're, we're watching it. Thank you. Oh, wait a minute. That's not right. Um, how many people are business majors or engineering majors here? Raise your hand. Oh, I feel so bad for you guys. All right, when I first started out 40 years ago, uh, I was a business major at Santa Clara University. And to tell you the truth, I wasn't wild about it. And just by accident, I took an art class. And I loved it. I loved working with my hands. And in fact, so much, I went home and I told my, my father I, I, I wanted to be an artist. And he said to me, um, well, that's great. Do you, do you draw? And I said, well, no. And he said, you must be, you like to paint. And I said, well, no. So he gave me some really great advice. He said, number one, if you find something you really love to do, you'll never work a day in your life. He gave me permission to take a leap of faith. And I did. I went over to San Jose State University, became an art major, and realized that was not the place for me either. And I wanted to get out of school as fast as I could because I wanted to start making things and I wanted to sell them. And I started selling little stuffed animals at street fairs, county fairs for about five years. And everybody, including my friends and family, thought I was the biggest loser on the planet. But I loved it. I loved every minute of it. I got to meet people. But I also I learned something really, really important. Hopefully that will switch. If you don't create something that sells quickly, you don't pay the rent and you don't eat. It was the most important lesson that I've, I've, I learned selling on the street corners. And it's the same lesson that I'm going to hopefully talk a little bit about it today with you, because whatever you do, you got to make something that people want, right? And that's sometimes a little tricky, but it's very important. So now, I'm 27 years old. I haven't had a job yet. And there is an article in the Modesto Bee um, about this. In fact, it's Fremont. I'm sorry, Fremont, California. And there's an article about this teddy bear called Teddy Ruxpin. It was a startup company. It was the first talking teddy bear. And I looked at the teddy bear, and it didn't look very good. It was a prototype. So I went down, and I called the company. I went down for an interview, and I just knocked on the door. And they said, what do you do? And I said, I think I can make this teddy bear look cute. And they hired me to work at this startup called Worlds of Wonder. And I got to work on two really amazing number one hit toys. One was Teddy Ruxpin. And the other one was laser tag. And I learned so much. It was the first company. I'm getting a paycheck. Things are fantastic. I love it. Now, I'm not quite sure if you remember Teddy, but I think I have a video here that you could probably watch. Show and tell time. Another teddy bear? My teddy's name is Teddy Ruxpin. He talks. He tells stories. He... Four batteries not included. Hi. My name is Teddy Ruxpin. Can you and I be friends? Yeah. I really enjoy talking to people. I would like you... Teddy Ruxpin, the storytelling bear, comes with illustrated book and cassette from Worlds of Wonder. Now, what was so amazing about Teddy Ruxpin is that we sold 5 million talking teddy bears 
in a very short period of time, and we became the fifth largest company, toy company in the world with one idea. And I got to see all of it. In fact, I got to see it so much that I wanted to do something else. I was over in China, my job, since I was manager of design, I, my job was to be on the production line to make sure all the teddies looked great. And something dawned on me. In fact, I was over there for months at a time and I was pretty lonely, I wanted to come back home. I definitely didn't want to be on someone's production line because the inventor of Teddy Ruxpin, Ken Forsay, was making a million dollars in royalties every single month. Every month, he's not there, I'm there, who knows where he is. And something else my father told me that finally, it made sense after all these years. Let's see if I can get that going. He said to me, if you want to create wealth, you have to find something that doesn't require these or your presence, and you need to find something that has that multiplying effect. And I didn't get it until I was on that production line watching these bears go down and figuring out how much money this inventor was making because I wanted to do the same thing he was doing. I wanted to learn about licensing because he had licensed Teddy Ruxpin to a company called Worlds of Wonder and I got to see it firsthand. So, very quickly, I went, uh, I moved to Modesto and I started coming up with ideas. And one of the first ideas I came up with was an indoor basketball game. You see, I love basketball. And I had this Nerf game in my office and had a little logo of Michael Jordan on it. And I thought it was too small. So I went ahead and bought a poster of Michael Jordan. I put it on the backboard and I loved this idea. And I remember showing it to my wife. See, I'd met my wife, Janice, at Worlds of Wonder. She was basically running the company. It's the smartest woman I ever met. She went to Stanford. She got her MBA at Northwestern. And she was up there running the company with this red dress. I'll never forget it. We moved to that small town, Modesto. We got married. Now she's vice president of marketing for the largest winery in the world, Gallo Winery. And her specialty is new products. And I'm a product developer. I'm a product artist. So I cannot wait for her to come home every evening and show her my ideas. Because she's going to tell me the winners from the losers. So sure enough, she came home and I have this big sketch pad. And I have all these ideas on this sketch pad and the really lousy ones are up at the top and we're laughing. And at the very bottom, I've got this idea of a basketball game with the backboard in the shape of Michael Jordan. And she says to me, the chances of you licensing that idea are about one in a million. Forget about it. So the very next day, I sent it off to that company, Ohio Art. And three days later, I had a contract. Couldn't believe it. They loved it. In fact, they loved it so much, it sold for 10 years. No protection whatsoever. It cost about $10 to produce it and they love it. I'm collecting royalties. The first year royalties were $100,000 the first year on an idea that took about 15 minutes and about $10 of material, and I can't believe it. So, now picture this. I'm Saturday morning, I've got kids, I'm sitting on the couch, I'm on one end, my kids are here, my wife is on the other end, and this comes up. Go one-on-one -on -one with Michael Jordan right in your own room with Michael Jordan Wall Ball. Best looking backboard I've ever seen. Michael Jordan Wall Ball from Ohio Art Sports. And I'm on the couch and this comes on and I'm looking at my wife going... <laughs> the lesson I learned is very simple. The only opinion that matters is the opinion of the company you're showing your idea to. Not your friends, not your family, but companies that you're going to submit your idea to. So, let's see what we got here. I finally come up with the big idea. Now, most of my ideas are really simple. I've licensed over 20 ideas off and on through my whole career, and they were just really simple things. But even simple things, you can create a nice income. But I finally have the big idea. And I'm reading a paper 
um, one, one morning during the week, and it was in the Modesto Bee, and it, there was an article how there was never enough information on labels. Huh, interesting. I happened to have licensed an idea to a company that was selling a rotating cup and canteen to all the Disney theme parks around the world. It was a very simple idea, it was very, very clever. And I thought, gee, if I could take that same technology and make a label that could deliver more information, I might have a great solution. I might actually have a big idea. So I went down to my office at the time, and it was at Kinko's, and I had a little drawer there. And I, I went down to Walmart, I grabbed a bottle off the shelf, I ripped off the label, and I made my first rotating label. And I remember I brought it home, I showed it to my wife, I said, what do you think? And she goes, I'm not too sure about this one. And I knew I might have been onto something there. <laughs> so sure enough, I get this call, I'm showing it to companies. And one company responds back, Procter & Gamble. In fact, the CEO saw my little sample I made at Kinko's and said, could you please come to Cincinnati and show this great innovation to our technical group at Procter & Gamble? I said, fantastic. I told my wife, I said, look, what do you think? She said, this is not gonna be a good idea. They're too big, you're too small, don't go. I said, look, Janice, put the red dress on, we're going to P&G, and that's exactly what we did. And I remember, we went out for lunch. We got there, and the guy took us out to lunch, and invited us out, and after lunch, I'm walking across the grass, and the sun is shining, and it's a beautiful day. I'm thinking to myself, I finally made it. I have a big idea, and the biggest company on the planet is calling me, and they want my innovation. And so I thanked the gentleman for, for lunch. And he said, Steve, remember one thing. There's no such thing as a free lunch. I looked over at my wife and she gave me that look as I told you so. And we go into this meeting and the next thing you know, there's, we walk down this aisle and there's patents. On every wall there's patents. I've never seen so many patent plaques. I get in the meeting, I'm there, I'm showing my little sample. Janice gets up and talks about how we're going to use this label to put more information on it. A gentleman gets up, he slides a piece of paper across the table. Now there's 20 people from P&G in this meeting. They slide a piece of paper across the table and it has all these patent numbers on it. You see, I had filed two patents out of fear. I, done, I did my prior art search and no one found a prior art, so this looks like it's my invention. Sure enough, all those numbers that gentleman passed across the table, he got up and he said to me, Mr. Key, we're not going to pay you one penny for that idea. I didn't know what to do. My wife looked at me again. I knew this wasn't going well. So I got home. I sent my attorney this sheet of all these numbers, and guess what? They found my idea that I thought I invented. So my attorneys told me, forget about it, just like their attorneys told me to. Well, I learned a very important lesson because I started filing patents because I read, I read the patents because this had been invented 70 years ago. My idea exactly was invented 70 years ago. Not a little bit like it, exactly like it. But there was something wrong. I kept on reading it. If it wasn't on the store shelf and Procter & Gamble had invited me out, what went wrong? And what I realized, there was no method of manufacturing. Could not believe it. Started filing patents. And fast forward, you see me there with 13 patents. Today it has over 20 on the same idea. 20 patents on the same idea. And let me show you a little Sundown bit. Herbals presents its remarkable twist and learn label. It works like an herbal information center that helps you learn about herbs simply by turning the label. Sundown's new Twist and Learn label, Where to Turn for Help. We sold 500 million labels. It's made millions of dollars for me. No one in this room has even seen it. That's what's amazing. Sometimes you can have a hit and still produce a lot of income with ideas that no one's ever seen. You see, 500 million labels sounds like a lot of labels, but it, really it's not. Coca-Cola does a billion Cokes a day. So put that in perspective, I barely scratched the surface, but it still produced quite a, quite a revenue stream for me. 
It's been on Nescafe coffee. It's in some of the colleges, national parks, places like that. Now, all you do is you spin it. It gives you more information. It's a really simple idea. So what I learned through all of it, you have to be the expert always. You have to. You have to do your own homework. You have to dig a little deeper. Ask why. So don't count on anybody. Count on yourself. That's the lesson I learned. So what do I do now? I want to get back to what I do because I think you'll be a little surprised. I'm a product artist. I'm not a product developer. I don't have a background in engineering or even in business. I like products. I go down to the store. I look at ones I like and how can I make them better? I make small improvements on existing ideas. I don't try to reinvent the wheel. It takes too much time, too much money. I make small improvements on existing ideas. And then I take those improvements and I show them the companies that are selling similar ideas. Really simple. If I want to have my product at Walmart, I go down to Walmart, find the shelf that my product should be on, and then I call all those companies. It's as simple as that. Now what happens, if they like my ideas, they rent those ideas from me. I still own them, but they rent. It's called licensing. And licensing is an alternative to venturing. And that's why I'm here today. You see, historically, the business model that is being taught at the university level is to start a business. But not everybody wants to start a business. Not every product should become a business. Some people don't have the time, the money, the skill, or even the desire to start a business. So there is an alternative, and it's called licensing. You come up with an idea, you show it to a company, if they like it, they take it to market for you. And, and today it's speed to market. So that's the business model. And know what I love about it? It doesn't require your presence. It doesn't require your hands. It's the same thing my father was talking about. It was that same moment that it dawned on me that I wanted companies to work for me. And I wanted to have the freedom to do what I wanted to do. I didn't want to be trapped in going to an eight to five job. So in other words, they're working for me. And I really love that, thinking that I'm a guy from Modesto, California and figured that out. Okay, you know what I like about it? They do all the heavy lifting. They do the sourcing for manufacturing. They do the, the marketing strategy, advertisement. They do the fulfillment, distribution. They handle everything. And what do I do? Pretty much what I want to do, come up with more ideas. And that's the licensing business model. And what I really like about this, I can live anywhere and collect the checks. Now, it seems impossible. I know everybody's like, how do you do that? Do you, know, do you have to own something? Do you have, to have, do you have to have a patent on something? I'm here to say, no, you don't. We've been taught that you need to own something. That's not true. You need perceived ownership. Because I, I don't think you ever own anything. I have been in federal court. I sued a small toy company called Lego. And I learned something really important. Even with six patents, people can design around you. Who wants to argue over words? In today's world, it's speed to market. That's what's important. It's not protection, it's selling. Most licensing agreements that I see, and I see one about every week now, we have 12 coaches, we have students in 40 different countries. We see a lot of people licensing ideas. And guess what? There's no patents but there's perceived ownership with the provisional patent application. It's called a PPA. If you, if you haven't heard about it, please investigate. It's a great tool. You can file it yourself, and you should become the expert for about $65. It's a wonderful tool. So, some products there. I'll go through that. Has anybody seen this here? The Wolf Washer 360? What a crazy idea. There's no intellectual property on this whatsoever. This, this student of mine, now as a coach, Ryan Diaz, showed this to a lot of companies. Don't go after big companies either. Go after small companies, medium-sized companies. They love us. The big guys, very difficult to work with. He puts a video on 
Facebook, with no sound, it gets 100 million views, and then was able to get a licensing deal out of that. Here's another one, Grid It, another one of our students, it's an organizer, very, very clever, no intellectual property at the, at the very beginning, and you know what he did? He found that mid-sized company, showed the idea to, all the big guys didn't get it. They didn't get it, but this, the mid-sized guy loved it. And this product be, became um, a product that was in 1,500 different variations of this idea. And he did this just by showing us some interesting marketing tools, and I'll show you how to do that in just a minute. Pancake Bot, very, very simple too. This is another student here. He's licensed over 40 ideas, making royalties, showing companies, hey, I'm creative, and guess what? Companies begin to love you, and I'll tell you the reason why. You're working for them for free at first until they take your idea. It's called open innovation, and there's thousands among thousands and thousands of companies that need ideas. So it's an amazing model. What I like about licensing, speed to market, it's fast. If you had to build a company, it would take years. Okay, that's great. If you're really good at it, you're gonna have competition. No doubt about it. If you find the right partnership, and to find that partner that has the shelf space, they're kind of, you can almost take the competition out. Because now he's producing the product for you and you're collecting a royalty. So speed to market to me is very, very critical today, especially when there's so many copycats. You don't, there's no financial risk. That's right, you don't have to raise capital, write a business plan. You don't have to do it at all. They take the risk, you don't have to quit your day job. In fact, most of the students that we've been teaching for 16 years have jobs and they're licensing ideas. They're doing it Saturday or Sunday. They're doing it with their kids. You can even do it at school. That's amazing. We have students, that, we have one, one student that's 12 years old. Some are 16, 17, college. Some are 82, full gamut of playing the licensing model game. And guess what? I live at Lake Tahoe. Not a lot of business up in Lake Tahoe. You can live anywhere you want to. It's a small world now. Because I'm not meeting companies. I don't go out there and dance on the tabletop. I don't have to do that. Now with the internet, I send them a sell sheet or a one or a video, and I'll show you that in just a minute. So what I show them, because I don't have a slide up here, is it's called a sell sheet. It's a one-page advertisement for your idea. It has a great benefit statement at the top. Why do you care? You gotta grab someone's attention really, really fast. A picture of your product, maybe a prototype. Guess what? Have someone that's a, that's a graphic artist do a 3D computer-generated model of it. It doesn't even have to be real and show some features. Better yet, make a prototype, make a, a movie, one minute. Show a problem, black and white, someone struggling. Show your invention, people are smiling. Make it one minute, it's a great tool. More products are licensed with these little videos now. Wonderful. And file your provisional patent application. It gives you that perceived ownership. Those are the three things you need. It's so fun to do this. Hi, I'm Nick from Zuru and uh, this is a bunch of balloons. We uh, love working with inventors here at Zuru. This was uh, actually designed by a guy called Josh Malone out of Dallas, Texas. And uh, it's an incredible invention. You can fill entire 100 water balloons in 60 seconds. And uh, if it wasn't for the inventor community creating like all this great innovation, then uh, we wouldn't be able to bring parts to, to market like 100 balloons. So. I'm Todd Richards. I'm the president of Whammo. Are you an inventor? Are you somebody that has a great idea? Bring it to us. That's what we do at Whammo. We're looking for new, exciting products, and we've been doing it for 70 years. Bring us your idea. Let's see if we can make it Whammo. Oh. Hi, my name is Eric Quam. I'm Director of Product Development at Fat Brain Toy Co. And we love inventors. Now, what my job now is, is to contact companies and making sure they're open to product submissions. We have a website where we have thousands of companies saying, yes, we want your ideas. A lot of people think, why are they going to take my idea? Am I capable of doing it? And what I'm telling you, yes, you can do it. Anybody can do it. Find a point of difference. Make that small improvement and show it to a company. Protect it with the provisional patent application and send it off. Now, whoever you ever work with, always type in their name, type in complaints, 
And if something looks a little weird, go to the next company. It's really simple. Find those companies that will love you. Find those companies that embrace open innovation. So just to bring it all together, find something you love to do. You'll never work a day in your life. It's really simple. If you want to find that opportunity that creates wealth that doesn't require your presence or your hands, maybe look at licensing. If you don't want to start a business and do some of the other things that's required, you might want to look at the licensing model. It's another alternative. Better yet, if you want flexibility in your schedule, and I know that was really important to me. I wanted to work when I wanted to work, and I wanted to work hard, but I wanted to be rewarded for my work. That's why licensing was a perfect model for me. So I'm just happy to be here to kind of show you there is an alternative to starting a business. It's called licensing. And there's a lot of information. I have a book called One Simple Idea. And that's something that, that looks interesting. Please check it out at the library or pick it up on Amazon. All right. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Did I hit the time on that? You hit the time, just right. So why don't we, um, we'll sit down for a few minutes here and uh, continue this discussion. Um, and uh, certainly, uh, as usual, if students have questions, then we certainly will welcome uh, those as well. Um, you know, one of the themes that you seem to touch on is that uh, you should find things that you love um, as kind of the driving motivation for what you do. But uh, how do you balance that with being flexible and adaptive to what the market actually needs? Well, I, I think you need to find something you really love to do because you're going to work real hard at it. And you're, gonna, you're actually going to receive a lot of rejections, right? So if you really love what you're doing, you'll keep at it. That's why I say love what you do. And, and, and do this not to chase the dollar, but to chase that creativity, right? To, to um, find that thing that excites you. So how do you balance that? You said, how do you balance that between what, reality or? Well, yeah, with, with what the market needs and adapting to, to those needs. Yeah. I think if you look at um, any particular category from kitchen to pet to hardware, I mean, they're, they're all looking for the next new idea, right? So there's an appetite in this country that's so large, and you're just filling that. So I think if you look at their product line and know that they're going to be designing the next improvement, just get out ahead of it. So I think the best way is find something you really love, find a category you really love, and look at their product line, study it, and, and try to figure out the next improvement. So I, I, I appreciate that. And so what would you say is kind of the, the most important attribute of a budding entrepreneur or budding product designer? I think just being curious, right? Being curious and realizing that you're going to receive a lot of no's along the way, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, I think in order to get a couple yeses, you have to go through a few no's. And just believe in yourself when maybe others don't. But what I like about the licensing model, it's always a numbers game. Yeah. And life's, life's like a, a numbers game. You're going to have to come up with a lot of ideas. You're going to have to contact a lot of companies, and you're going to get a lot of no's. But every once in a while, you might get a yes. And then once you get that first yes, and you see your product on the shelf, uh, it's, a, it's the greatest feeling in the world. So it's curiosity combined with persistence, Yes, it sounds like. That's great. Um, you know, so you're clearly, in, in our interactions, um, very much an optimist. You, you see the sunny side of life, it seems like, continually. Um, and I think that's probably an important attribute as well, given the rejection you get uh, as you try to, try to license things out and share your ideas. Um, and you've shared with us a lot of highlights. What, what is one of the hard moments? That oh, boy. Um, you're, I'm the type of, um, you know, a lot of people that develop products, they see problems. I'm not really that type of product developer or product artist. I don't see problems. So I just try to design things that put a smile on people's face. That's all I try to do. So my method's a little bit easier. But let me tell you what's really heartbreaking. Go all ahead. Right. You, you come up with a great idea, and you get that company to license it from you, and you're working on, you're working with them as a team, and it hits the store shelf. 
Everything's there. Everything you want, it's there. And it doesn't sell. <laughs> now, you waited and worked for about a year, right? They've done all the heavy lifting. They've spent all the money and everything else. But when you see it on the store shelf, you're celebrating. But if the consumers don't buy it, that's a pretty big disappointment. So I think that's probably the biggest one for me. Yeah. And, and in your experience, is that... Um... Is that fairly common among your students? That the, that well, it's happened to me. I hope it's not too common. Uh, you know, I think you can help drive business a little bit. I think if you help your licensee sell more product, I think you're, you're smart to do that. Stay with it. Once you license an idea, don't walk away. Sure. Stay, stay with them and um, help them because the story now is that you're an inventor. Right. Okay, that's a story. And I tell everybody, when you reach out to a company, always be a product developer, never be an inventor, because they look at it a little odd. So approach them as that I'm a product developer. But once you license it, help them sell more, go out to the press, and tell your story. It's newsworthy. You can help sell more product. Got it. Got it. Excellent. Why don't we um, open it up a little bit to questions from the audience? Is there anyone who has a, a question for, for Stephen? I know some of you have, have come to my office even with your great ideas, so uh, now would be the great time to share some of those. Um, for the ideas that you have on your store shelf that actually don't pan out, uh, what's the next step? Do you go back and do you iterate upon those designs, or do you just uh, call it a day and work on something else? I'm not quite sure. So when a product does fail, oh. do you go iterate on that product, or do you usually just kind of set it aside and move on to the next great idea? Well, I, I try to figure out why. Um, like you say, you have to be curious about it. And if something's not working, why? So you might ask the store manager, you might look at the price point, you might look at the package, but those companies aren't gonna give you a second chance, right? Usually when something doesn't go well, they kick it to the curb real fast and then you can always get it back. See, the thing about licensing, with that licensing agreement, there's gonna be one clause, it's gonna be a performance clause. And that performance clause, it's called, um, you know, the one type of performance would be minimum guarantees. They have to sell X amount to keep that license. So if your product um, doesn't sell well, you get it back. And I've seen some, some students will take it back figure out what went wrong, and then submit it to somebody else again. I have seen that, and it does work. But you have to figure out why it's not selling. It's usually the price is the big deal. Someone's overdeveloped it a little bit, too many bells and whistles, and it just doesn't hit that sweet spot. So if I, if I come up with an idea, um, you know, how much does it need to be developed, right? Uh, so in other words, do I need to think about uh, the right name for my product, logo, packaging? Does it need to be, you know... Should I have made one or should I have made a hundred of them? What's kind of the, 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 right, play, the right time to go and, and start this process? Yeah, it depends on how much time, how much skill you have. And uh, I've seen ideas that were licensed. I've licensed an idea with a one-line sentence. This is what it is. And they saw it, they understood it. It didn't require a prototype, a name. Um, that was a, it was a little plastic arrow with a suction cup and a little message says, I'm stuck on you. And they called it sweet darts and sold everywhere. And I could not believe someone actually paid me for that idea, but they did. <laughs> um, but some ideas, you, you're going to have to do a little bit more work. If you have an idea that um, once a company's interested, let's, go, let's take it that way. Sure. I, I think if you show them, sell the benefit first, right? And when you sell the benefit first, if they like it, they're going to ask for a prototype. That might be a great time to build one then, right? I want the market to tell me, am I crazy or not, as fast as I can. So I, I'll come up with an idea in the morning, and I'll reach out to a company by the afternoon, show them a quick sell sheet, the benefit of it, and go, any interest? Because if there's no interest, why bother? I want the market to tell me, am, 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 I, am I on track? Am I thinking right? So, you know, we want to build prototypes. I love building prototypes. I love making things, but do that, but... Just don't, you know, don't take too long. Okay. So it, it seems one of the themes that you keep, you know, emphasizing really is speed. Speed. And so the methods that you use, that you've developed, are all about speed. How, how, what's the simplest, quickest approach I can, can do to... 
find out whether or not the idea is right, to get it to market, to you know, take those next steps. Well, the reason why is that I had to feed myself a, the, the selling those things at the street fairs and county fairs. I learned that real quick that if it didn't sell, I, I, I wasn't going to support myself. So I kicked it to the curb real quick. And with a sell sheet or a video, it allows me to do the same thing. Test that market real, real quick and see if there's interest. I also believe that you're gonna to have to reach out to a lot of companies too. And find that right one that raises their hand. And if they want a prototype, fine. Sometimes I've seen a student develop a logo, the name, and they took all of it. Very rarely will a company take your name. They, and you don't want them to, they wanna own it. Let them brand it. Let them have ownership in it and let it go. The one thing about licensing they have to realize, if you want control, licensing isn't the right business model for you because you don't have control. The only control you have would be um, those uh, minimum guarantees, right? That they fail, you get it back. Some companies will wanna work with you, they wanna talk with you, they'll, they'll, they'll bring you in as a team, but most of them will say, good idea, go away, you put your confidence in us. Yeah, this, this is, um, what you just described is what's commonly called the founder's dilemma. Huh. And, um, and the, this handoff of control versus speed or, or sometimes even scale, right? And so you are a person who seems to, to you know, be heavily on that side of control doesn't matter so much to me. I want speed and scale as quickly as possible. Yeah, I want to find a company that's really good at distribution, marketing. I'll find, they'll have some skills that are just great. So I want to find that company that's got those skills. My skills is finding those small improvements. So I'm not so worried about it. And I don't, you know, I've, I've had a company before where I hired an employees and you know I did all that fun stuff and it was a blast but it didn't really fit my long-term vision of what I wanted to do so the licensing model was very attractive to me because um, it gave me the freedom to be creative excellent excellent yeah. more questions from we have one up there Uh, so you've got your idea, you know, it hits you in your morning shower and you say that you've um, contacted a company by the afternoon with your idea. At that point, have you already filed for a PPA or are you just throwing it out there? Well, that's a great question. Technically, you don't have to file any intellectual property. You have one year. But if you've got an idea that you're really in love with, you might want to file a PPA first. Okay, but if you're someone like myself that has a lot of ideas and have figured out how to come up with ideas, because I think... Um, if, we, if you work on your, your uh, creative muscle, you can come up with ideas all the time. So I don't know if I'd file a PPA every time because I know I can file it. And I know that if I get into a company, if there's interest, I can file it later. I can file it faster than they can. And they don't know if I've filed or not. And guess what? These companies, a lot of people ask, why don't they just take your idea and not pay you? I mean, that's a really common question. Well, in the toy industry, they've been working with freelance toy designers for forever. And the reason why they keep on doing it, it lowers their overhead. Um, they only take the products that they like. So basically, you have all these people working for them for free. And if they took an idea, those doors would shut, right? And especially today, with um, the voice we all have on social media, um, companies are very concerned about us writing things about them. So I, I think there's a perfect storm that's happened. We have 3D printing, which is an amazing tool. We have crowdfunding, which is a great tool also. In fact, I'd use crowdfunding just to see the interest. And if, if I have a successful crowdfunding campaign, I can guarantee I can license it in a, like that fast. Some market validation. You bet, it's fast. So um, I think companies need us and I think we're a huge asset to them. And I tell everybody, some people are, are, are nervous about it. I tell everybody, just call a company up. Call a company you have no intention to even submitting an idea to. See how they treat you. And when they say, what do you have? That's when you're gonna realize, well, this wasn't hard to do at all. Because the hard part is that creative part, right? And that's what they're counting for us to do. 
So I, I think we, we're all creative. I just don't think a lot of us are developing that creative muscle. Yeah, so if I'm not an idea person, and clearly you are, right, that you come up with ideas constantly, um, if I'm not or one of our students is not one of those people who is an idea person, how do we become that kind of a person? I, I don't think I'm that creative, to tell you the truth, but I found a way of playing these, these fun games. And these games allow me to look at things differently. Um, like the Michael Jordan wall ball, I looked at the backboard and said, does it have to be square? I asked that question, well, why, why square? Or um, does it have to be, does that, does that have to be one rim or could it be multiple rims? Or could it have sound? Or I start going through this process of, of bringing other technologies in and go, what about this, what about that? So I play these games, one's called mix and match. I take an idea over here, and I have an idea over here and I bring them together to see if I create something brand new. And by doing that, um, it's really kind of a fun game. I can walk down an aisle of a store and start making matches and see if something pops. So that's a way of getting you to think a little differently, to imagine, have fun. And then there's other ones called what if and solve it. These are just fun, challenging mental games that you can do anywhere. But if you do them every day, you can call upon that, that creativity anytime you want. So I don't think I'm that creative, but I found a way of, of looking at anything and coming up with variations. And those are the variations or those improvements that I show to companies. That's great. We have another question over here. Um, let's say a company invites you to talk about your concept over a conference call, but this company isn't a middle like kind of player that you're saying, but one of the largest in the industry. Does that change the game or do you have any suggestions on how to kind of go about talking to them? Sorry, you're saying if, if the company is not the largest or is the largest? It is the largest company. If they are the largest, does that change the way you, you approach them and negotiate with them? Yes. Absolutely. Um, if, you really, if you really want to get a deal done, but there, there's a couple things you can do to guarantee to get a licensing deal. Um, if you're, especially with the big player, find, find something that will pull it for you. It's called pull-through marketing. I don't, that's what I call it. And what happens, I might show it to a retail buyer. When I was doing the spin label, I showed it to everybody. I got turned down by over 100 companies. And one company, Rexall Sundown in, in, in Boca Raton, Florida, uh, they loved it. But I couldn't get a manufacturer to make it. They just wouldn't do anything. So I went out, showed it to a customer. They wanted it, then I went back to that manufacturer and said, they'll take 50 million labels. Without that pull, it wouldn't have gone anywhere. So with very large companies, what you can do, make sure you have good, strong intellectual property, make sure that you can show proof of concept, show demand somehow, crowdfunding demand maybe. I've seen a great licensing arrangement happen recently. Someone had an idea, showed it to a big company, they said no put it on a crowdfunding, and they came back and said yes, because it proved. So show that proof of demand, and large companies will even respond. Oh, that's excellent. Now, you say, for example, in that particular one, you were rejected close to 100 times. Yeah. Now, is that, over what time period is that? Is that you know, a matter of days, weeks, no, years? No, that took me a while. I, um, when I was doing the spin label, I, I met someone that had relationships with all the top um, people in the packaging industry, like Procter & Gamble and everybody okay. else. And I made a sample. I made a sample for everyone, sent them a letter. Um, and sure enough, they wrote back, I kept every one because it was a paper trail in case they got around me. So that's why I have a record of all hundred of them. But it only takes one. It only takes one. Now, what's really great about it, you don't have to fly out and make a presentation. Today, um, it's all done with a sell sheet or a little video that you send to them, but always get permission first. And um, if you want to know how to get into companies, because that's a real difficult thing, um, I have a free ebook that if you send me an email, I'll send it to you. It's, a, it's, a, it's an ebook that I developed with my coaches that are using LinkedIn, that are using what to say, how to, how to contact these companies, all the things you should do. It's absolutely free, it's an ebook. And if you want it, I can, I can supply it. And it's a, 
It has all the strategies that we've developed over the years, and guess what? It really does work. Excellent. Now, in your experience, I mean, I think a lot of people look at, you know, people like you or maybe even some of your students who get these big deals into, you know, on the shelves of Walmart or wherever, um, and they say, you know, they're just lucky. Right? How, how much is opportunity versus luck at, at play here? Uh, luck is when you knock on enough doors that one of them opens. I think, um, I think it, there's a lot of luck to it, but I think you create your own luck. And I think you create your own luck by being the last guy standing sometimes and believing. Um, I, I, I realize that you can control your destiny a little bit um, by working hard, believing in it, reaching out to a lot of companies, be flexible. Um, you can create your own luck. Don't stop too early. That's the catch too. Um, I used to, when I first started, I'd call a couple companies. If I got no, I, I came up, I'd run and do another idea right away. But now call at least 20 to 30 of them. Get as many no's as you can. Go through that list because there's going to be a yes out there. That's excellent. Stephen, thank you for being with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. So all of this was happening as a youth. And I think what I've learned about kids is they are literally born to be entrepreneurs. I can remember one time my daughter Megan being with me at Kroger and uh, groceries are passing by the little...